Institutions of higher education are places where culture and society are studied from a variety of different perspectives with the hope of advancing the various cultural conversations in helpful ways. Theological seminaries, by virtue of being institutions of higher education, inevitably participate in this cultural conversation. Our approach, however, is not simply observational, but interested, as is, is the, the case with many ideological readings of culture. We hope, of course, that our interested reading is not primarily ideological, but essentially theological, even if telling the difference is getting harder and harder these days. In any case, as Calbart once put it, we should preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper or your phone app in the other. We do not simply observe cultural dynamics and the cultural tools deployed in larger society, but we assess them critically, deploying our own frameworks and tools to dialogue with and hopefully influence the culture with the gospel. There's probably no more intense cultural debate in society nowadays than the debate on race and ethnicity. And society, culture, and the church are being shaped by academic conversations on the topic more than people in general are capable of realizing. How do we engage in that conversation as a Christian theological institution? More specifically, how have the tools developed in various academic spaces been deployed in Christian educational organizations and to what degree of success? Is there a particular Christian way of engaging in this debate? And if so, what is that way? To facilitate that conversation, we have invited Dr. George Yancey from uh, Baylor University, who has been researching precisely the various approaches to these issues and their effectiveness in advancing the conversation. To be sure, I do not expect George to answer all the questions I just proposed, but. I do hope that this, his talk will give a substantial food for thought as we continue our own conversation in classrooms, forums, and individual discussions. Dr. George Yancey is a professor of sociology at Baylor University. He has published several research articles on the topics of institutional racial diversity, racial identity, academic bias, progressive Christians, and anti-Christian hostility. His books include Compromising Scholarship, Baylor University Press, what Motivates Cultural Progressives, Baylor University Press, and most recently, Beyond Racial Division, a unifying alternative to color blindness and anti-racism, uh, InterVarsity Press. Offering a response to Dr. Yancey, we have our own newly hired uh, uh, Hansen Associate Professor of Leadership, Dr. Nicholas Rowe. Nicholas Rowe comes to Gordon-Conwell with nearly 30 years of higher education experience in, fa in faculty and senior administrative roles. Most recently, he was Associate Vice President for Student and Global Engagement at Gordon College. His teaching and research, inter research interests investigate how communities use the past to form collective identities and how this fuels intergroup conflict. Let's welcome our speakers. So some of you may remember me from last year. Last year I came and talked to a, good, a lot of you all and listened and I really wanted to know where you're coming from. And uh, my, my opinion is that I think that this you know, seminar has a lot of potential to break the racial law jam. But for you to do that, you're gonna have to be challenged. And so I'm here to challenge you. And that's what this talk's gonna be, it's gonna be a challenge. Because we gotta do something different. I know about challenge. I have a seven, uh, six, and four-year-old boys. Boys. <laughs> so, you know, as a father, you know, I try to do my best. And I remember about three weeks ago that uh, I we finally wrestled and got him in the bed and I could settle down. You know, I'm a faithful Longhorn fan. The Longhorns are playing basketball. You all think you're playing basketball up here, but Big 12 is where they're playing basketball. <laughs> yes. And the Longhorns, you know, they're in first place. And, and so I looked around the, my uh, living room with the channel changer because, of course, it's not the good old days where you can just turn on TV. Of course, you got to get your, your TV channel, and then you got your stream channel. You know. and I couldn't find the stream channel. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't watch the Longhorns play. And I was panicking, so I went to my oldest boy. And I said, hey, have you seen the remote? And he said, no. So I kept looking around the living room because we had told the boys, don't take the remote out of the living room. And then 10 minutes later, he says, I did have it, and he gave it to me. 
And my reaction was one of aspiration. What have we told you about the remote? Don't take it out of the living room. What are you doing? It was natural for me to, for me to feel frustrated. Longhorns were playing. And to even express that. But what was sort of damage was I doing to my boys, to my relationship with him? You see, doing that, and yes, it was sort of you know, selfish for him to withhold it when, when we knew I was looking for it. So he had lessons to learn. But I was damaging that relationship. But it made me feel good. But I wasn't doing good. That's what I want to talk to you about today. And here's a question I'm going to come back again and again and again. Do you want to feel good or do you want to do good? Now, sometimes they're the same thing and sometimes they're not. And sometimes we think what we're doing is good and then it's not. So when we learn that it's not, what are we going to do? So, you know, I'm, I'm here at this wonderful seminary. And so at chapel, I'll, I actually try to talk a little theology tomorrow at chapel. And I'm scared. Because I have all these theologians around. But to not today, I'm going to bring in a little sociology. And here, I'm the bad boy in the room. <laughs> I want to talk to you about an approach that, and, and trust me, I know the alternative to this approach, and I'll deal with that tomorrow. But I think that for this, from what I learned last year, I need to deal with some extra time on, on this approach. And that approach is anti-racism. Now, what is anti-racism? You, you know, we know all this argument about what is critical race theory, da 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 da, da. You know, anti-racism is actually a little bit easier. Because what I did was I read the major books on anti-racism that was out there. Uh, white Supremacy and Me, How to Be an Anti-Racist, White Fragility. And what I found out was certain keys as to what is anti-racism. And anti-racism is what a lot of people are using to try to deal with the racial problems in our society. So let's understand what it is. And then let's think, is it doing good or is, or is it feeling good? One of the aspects of anti-racism is being proactive in dealing with racism. So anti-racism talks about how we must, when we see racism, we must be proactive. We don't wait for it to happen. We happen to it. We eradicate it as soon as we possibly can. And that was in all the books that I read. And it's mainly all parts of the system. One thing the anti-racists keep talking about is anti-racism is not just an individual. It's systematic. It's institutional. And, and these are the things that we have to, have to deal with. Now, for me, I'm like, so far, so good. This sounds pretty good. Societal change is necessary. Now, this varies depending on who you're talking, about, talking to. You know, uh, if you're looking at, say, D'Angelo, you, you know, it's sort of more of a therapeutic type of approach. Uh, Kindy is, you know, he's, he's like, let's tear down capitalism. But this whole thing of social change, you know, here, you know, I go, well, you know, it depends on what you're talking about. Do we want to throw the baby out the bathwater, you know? Sometimes we want to change things. So, you know, I'm a little bit itchy. And then here comes the key. The responsibility of whites is to do what people of color want. Go to a book on anti-racism. Tell me that's not the message that's there. Tell me that's not the message that, that's constantly there. And here's where I think anti-racism falls apart. Because this is not going to work. And I understand why people have come to this. And I, you know, I've experienced racism in my life. The, you know, I, I'm not Candace Owens. You know, I experienced racism in my life. This does not work. Now, it's not just my opinion. It's not just my opinion. There's research along the lines. Now, before I get into this research, I want you to think about who, who, who does research on anti-racism. Is it people wearing MAGA hats? Shake your head this way, no. <laughs> people who do research on anti-racism are people who are, to some degree, committed to this idea, right? We're, we're race scholars. We're, we're more progressive, at least on racial issues. So 
understand this as we look at some of this research. Diversity training. What we know is it has little long-term effect on prejudice. And we know this through something called meta-analysis. Now, meta-analysis, uh, I'll try not to be too much of a nerd, a meta-analysis is when you look at a lot of studies and then you, you look at all the results together. And when you do that, what you find is, at best, you temporarily reduce prejudice and then it comes back six months later. It's like you send your kid off to Bible camp. <laughs> Boy, I don't want to send my kids off to Bible camp right now. And they come back and they're on fire for the Lord and it lasts like two weeks. <laughs> right? Now, you hope that there may be a long term, but that's what happens. You may get a temporary balance, but you don't get any, but it doesn't last. Diversity programs can convince whites they've solved all the racial problems in their organizations. According to this research here, what happened is you put this program in there, the whites in the organization start feeling, okay, see, we solved the problems. And then they don't want to make any further changes. We can make others aware of stereotyping, and that can increase stereotyping. You know, I've, I've been following this whole, and I'm not going to dive into it, I've been following this whole debate on Christian nationalism and stuff like that. And what's interesting to me, and I have my critiques about, you know, methodologically about how it's done and stuff like that. And once again, you know, I'm a sociologist, so I won't bore you with that. But what's interesting to me is now I'm finding people who are engaging now and say, okay, I'm a Christian nationalist, I'm gonna be this way. I mean, I, I actually listened to a, uh, to, to a debate between someone who is kind of like a sort of Christian, someone who's a Christian nationalist and proud of it. I mean, we think that <clears throat> maybe people wear a stereotype and it makes them not want to engage in that. That's not necessarily the case. <clears throat> this was an interesting one. This research looked at teaching about privilege. <clears throat> and what, what uh, she found out, her team, is that what it does is it decreases sympathy for marginalized whites, but it does not increase sympathy for marginalized people of color. I was reading this uh, substack <clears throat> about this lady who was in his, cla in, in his classroom. And she was questioning white privilege. Oh, thank you. Yes. She was questioning white privilege. You know, white privilege, not that it didn't exist, but that was all encompassing. So she said a question such as, so I know of a, uh, a white family that is very poor, that, uh, you know, was on food stamps, uh, raising their family. You're telling me that the daughters of the Obamas have advantage over them in every single way. And the class business said yes. Now, I, white privilege is a thing. My boys have great advantages over a poor white family living in Appalachia. Not in every single way, but my boys have a lot going for them that they don't. Why do we have this sort of distorted image that a white person has all these advantages, they're like they're, just, they're magical, and, and, and you know, this boom, and everything goes, have you not known white people who, are, who, are, who, are mar who have been abused, who have been on drugs, who, have, have you never known that? And there are people coming here. Now, that's not to dismiss racism. You can say that and not dismiss racism. We've got to stop being so extremist in our mentality. Diversity can create a backlash against people of color. Once again, research shows you put in a program, and instead of creating more sympathy, People start resenting the program, <clears throat> and you have to create more hostility. If you, if you justify your diversity program by diverse rationale and say, hey, we want to be more diverse, we're going to put this program in here. Rather than merit, you reinforce notions of minority inferiority. So what people start saying is, oh, you hired them because they are black, not because they are qualified. Now, this is research, and if you, if you think that I'm cherry picking the research, you're welcome to look at other research. I looked for research saying diversity programs work. I found two studies. Small scale studies uh, dealt with professionals show a small effect. 
When you listen to people who talk about these things, people who know the research, they tell you what we're doing now does not work. When I read the anti-racism books, I looked as a scholar, are you citing any research showing that by teaching people about white fragility, it's going to make them more sympathetic to people of color? They, she cited none. None of them do. The research shows that this approach does not work. It is not doing good. That's it. It's not doing good. This is a really interesting study from Dobbins and Cowbridge. Uh, if you want to look, look up an article on why diversity programs fail. So they study 829 mid-sized and large US firms. They document efforts to increase minority representation among managers, not among the workers, but among managers. Okay? So they wanted to know what can companies do in order to increase the number of minorities who work as managers. They also looked at women, and they found the same results, but I'll just concentrate on, on, the, on the Russian minorities for this point. They looked at the results five years later. So they looked at these companies and said, what are you doing? Then they went away five years later. Do you have more Russian minorities as managers? So this is very just, you know, this is, this is quantitative. Here's the number of managers you have now. What number of managers do you have five years later? All right. So this is, you know, this, there's no, there's no sort of philosophy or or moral. It's just very, very stuff. What does not work, as you might well imagine? Yes, mandatory. That's ma that majority. Okay. <laughs> that should be mandatory. <laughs> mandatory diversity programs. Five years later, companies that had mandatory diversity programs had fewer managers of color. Fewer, not more, not the same. Fewer. Job testing. So what, what, what some companies did is they said, look, you know, you can't just hire your buddy because you're just going to hire another white person. So we're going to you know, make sure everyone has to have this job test, and then you have to hire the best person there. But what they found out five years later is those companies actually have fewer managers of color because what that happened was the white managers circumvented it and hired their people anyways. When you try to force things on people, they find ways around it. <clears throat> Grievance system. So we're going to set these grievance systems. So if you're a person of color and you face racism, you can go to the system and you can get justice. Great. Five years later, there's fewer of you around. This does not work. Now, that's the bad news. There actually were things that worked. Some companies actually had more managers of color five years later. I think it's very telling what tends to work. First, voluntary training works. Mentor training does not. Now, there's a couple reasons why that could be. They didn't go into it. It could be that you have a different training. When it's voluntary, I have to keep your attention. I have to make you want to be here. It's mandatory. I can do whatever I want, right? And humans don't do well when they have that sort of power. But also, voluntary people are choosing. And when you can choose, you get buy-in. We all know this. You know, raising boys, I want them to choose, make the right choices as much as possible. Sometimes, yeah, I have to, we have to intervene. But I want them to make, because then they're buying into it. Mentoring. You take those white managers, you know, if you're mostly white managers, say, hey, will you help mentor these people of color? What's that doing? You're telling them, hey, will you help me? Instead of, here's what you're going to do. Likewise, diversity task force, usually headed up by those white managers, five years later, they have more managers of color. We're doing good. Or making diversity managers. <clears throat> so, to do good, if you want to hire more managers of color, you need to not try to impose a system on the manager that's there. You need to go to those managers and work with them. Get them on board. Look at learn from their ideas and work together. But what about justice? You know, shouldn't we, uh, you know, they're part of the problem. Are we going to go and work with them? Yes, if you want to do good. If you want to feel good, you put in a mandatory diversity training program. You know, one thing I hear sometimes is uh, people say something to the effect of, uh, well, even though this is not effective, what we're doing is right. You know, 
Uh, you know, we, we, hear, we, see, we see this stuff, research, and we can't deny it. We know this is not working, but that doesn't mean it's the wrong thing to do. And I just go, is it not working in the indication this not be, might not be a good thing to do? And it's not just that it's not working. There's some research showing that this makes things worse. So if, if we're making things worse in our interactions, should we not be asking questions about what we're doing and why it's not working? And I, I'm also troubled because there seems to be like an assumption that, well, we can engage in this sort of activity, and yeah, if we get people on board, it'd be great, but there's no real downside. Well, unfortunately, there can be a downside. Now, this is, this is an exceptional case, and I'm not saying this happened all over the place, but it can happen. There's an article that came out uh, uh, about two weeks ago, named by this, so if you want to look it up, you can. Uh, a black professor trapped in anti-racism hell. Can I say that on seminary? Sorry. Um, <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna summarize this for you. And, and once again, feel free to look this up. This was authored by Vincent Lloyd, who is, who wrote Black Dignity, The Struggle Against Domination. He's a critical race, I don't know if he's critical race, he's critical uh, theorist. So, once again, this is not Ward Connolly or some sort of African American who's a secret MAGA person. This is a person who is in the middle and advocating for many of the things that people are talking about. He led promising high school students on seminars on anti oppression studies. So these, these students were able to apply here. They came from across the country. I believe he's at Cornell. I forget if he's at Cornell. He's at one of the Ivy Leagues, you know, bigger than, than us. Lowly Baylor people. Uh, so he had these, and he had these special, so he could have these seminars, this would be great, but they could talk about the, the readings, and, and, and his idea was to have this dialogue and to learn. I mean, you all are in seminars, so you know the idea behind seminars. The students would explore anti racism ideas in dialogue with each other. Now, understand, most of the people who come in here, they're applying for anti oppressive studies, so you're, you're getting people who are already kind of on board. What could go wrong? Students are given the power to govern each other and the seminar. So, very democratic. You notice, the first student, the white students learn to shut up. Now, unfortunately, I've seen this experience, I've seen this phenomenon myself. So, that doesn't surprise me. It's like, okay, yeah, you know, that, that's going to happen. But what really happened was surprising is that two Asian students who were expelled from the students that they voted them off the island, if you will. And their, their offense was they want, they, they, they want to ask questions about some of the readings. And so they were voted off the island. The students even tend to expel Lloyd because he wasn't telling them what to do. He was telling them, hey, what do you all think about this? And they felt that that was inviting people to have discussions on the readings. They wanted to read these readings and then be dictated as to how to think about them. Alternate opinions were not allowed. At the end of his time, Lloyd felt he had been in an abusive relationship with the students. Now, I'm not saying that it always ends this way, but I've seen versions of this that weren't as bad as this, but bad enough. If we're creating, oh, do I, oh, do you not, can you not hear me? Being recorded. Oh, okay, okay. Because usually that's not a problem with me. <laughs> you know, I've had classes of 200, and I can project I'm black. You know, we don't have to do that. So, uh, okay, I, I'll be closer. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll move less. Uh, <laughs> but if this, if this has, if what we're doing has the potential to create an abusive relationship situation, should we not ask questions about it and figure out guardrails instead of? doing things such as, uh, you know, if I, if I look at white fragility, uh, the role of whites is basically to listen to people of color and then try to do better. Because I can think of all sorts of really bad guardrails ra that we would need before I would allow something like that to be dominant in any organization I was in. It's almost as we act as if people of color who have been victimized cannot also engage in human depravity. And I am one, and yes, we can. So, what do I what I suggest? 
Some of you may be familiar, I suggest what's called a collaborative conversation approach, where everyone is obligated to work toward healthy interracial communication to solve racial problems. Everybody means everybody. You do not get to say, I don't have to work towards talking with you because I'm black. No. Absolutely not. And you think I'm joking, but that, that attitude has come out. That's, everyone is obligated. This does not mean, I'll be very clear about this, this does not mean that solutions are going to be some sort of egalitarian, colorblind mishmash. You, it's all on the table. But you've got to work towards it. Remember, when you put the white managers in there and they work towards a solution, you've got better solutions. Okay, so obviously I, I don't have time to go completely into it, but I just want to give you some foundations of this approach. And, and uh, you know, yes, I did, I did write a book, and so you can always, get, you know, always make, make me a few more dollars because I got to feed those boys. <laughs> but my wife, you know, the other day, uh, she, she came back, you know, we, she made cinnamon toast, 12 pieces, and I went back to my room and came out, and they're all gone. <laughs> and my wife says, we got to get some more, you know, we got to, buy some stock in Kroger because we're going to buy them out when they become teenagers. Teenagers, oh my gosh. All right, no one has all the right answers. Guess what? You don't either. I don't. I've been studying this stuff for a long time, too long. I told God, let me, let me go, and he wouldn't let me go. Uh, I don't have all the right answers. I still, I'm still learning. And should that not always be our attitude? You know, you know who you need to learn from the most, and this kills me. I knew them from the people the most is the people that I reject the most. Whoever that may be. Whoever that may be. We need to listen to each other to get better answers. And there's research out there on that. I'm not, I, don't, I don't have it to cite right now. But you know, one of the reasons why diversity is good is you, you get more people involved. And you get, actually do get better answers. That's just more effective. So we, we cannot shut anyone out of the conversation. We listen and negotiate better solutions with those whom we disagree. So and I told this story last night and, uh, at dinner, and I, I want to tell it again because it's a great story. I wish I could say it was mine. It's not. I'm going to tell it like about a dozen more times, and I'm going to say it's my story. Uh, so there's, there's a couple of roommates, and they're arguing. And they're arguing about whether to keep the window up and up open or closed. And one says, I want it open. I says, I want it closed. And they argue, argue, argue. And what are we going to do? You know, what sort of compromise? Halfway open? Well, I win because it's open. You know, or, 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 or what? And then they start discussing, why do you want it open? Why do you want it closed? One says, I want it open because it's hot. And, you know, I want the air to, re to come in. I says, I want it closed because bugs are coming in. So now we have solutions, right? Maybe you close the window and you get a fan for the person who's hot. Or maybe you buy a screen for the window and you open the window. You see, and here's the thing that we be very careful, and I think it's so easy to slip into this. We think of our solutions as win-lose. Other people have to lose, and then we feel good. Wouldn't it be better if we had win-win solutions? Because if you have win-win solutions, everyone's invested in making sure it works. You have a win-lose solution, Someone's investing in making sure it falls apart. You know, one of the, <clears throat> this is a little off topic, but <clears throat> one of the sad things about COVID, among many other sad things, was we could not solve that as a nation because we're invested in other people losing. And I can say that for a lot of different parties. I'm not, I'm not pointing my fingers at any one group. There are times where I thought one group was, yeah, Here's the obvious solution, but they don't want it because it makes them look good. And then I saw the other group do the same thing, too. We need to strive for win-win. I just did that. I'm going to do it. <laughs> we are all accountable for working with others and not just forcing our views on them. OK? We have to change this mentality. If you all just did what I said, then we'd be OK. Well, yeah, I mean, dictators, yeah, have peace. But is that what we really want? All right, so 
There is some research back in some of what I'm saying, not, not as much as we need, and I hope to do more in the coming years. Uh, but we do know that under the right conditions, interracial contact alleviates bias. So, you know, and there's a ton of stu research on this, uh, but it, it is pretty clear to us. Uh, having a common group identity increases positive feelings. The more we feel that we're together, I mean, really, you know what the best thing for a race relationship would be is an alien invasion. Because then we all be humans and be working together for once, you know. Uh, but I mean, on a more serious note, we know that when we, ha when we feel this a common, you know, y'all have this common thing as far as being part of Gordon Conwell. That gives you some positive feelings. You know, it's not, it's not the, the end all be all, but it, it, it helps. And the more we can feel that we belong together, the better off. Families with, with collaborative orientation have positive interactions in relationship with each other. You know, families that learn how to work together. One of the things that I'm, we're trying to do with our boys is learn how to collaborate with each other. Because we, we asked, my wife and I, we asked the question, you know, we believe this, how do we do this with our boys so they don't get sucked into one thing or the other? And so one of the things that we're, we're trying to teach them to do, and we can't, you know, it doesn't always work out, is to work out problems themselves rather than having to solve the problems. So when they work, you know, and if you have more than one kid, you know that the favorite toy is, is, the to is a toy that your brother or sister's playing with. And so we try to have them work, because we want them to learn how to collaborate, how to think about other people and not just themselves. It's hard on the four-year-old, uh, you know, but when it, when it works, we like, yes. We, we did a little bit teaching them to have a collaborative orientation. And, and, and when, it, when it does work, it's beautiful. You know, they actually play together and they, and they, they enjoy each other, they build a community. A cloud communication and atmosphere mutual support, volitional compliance. Remember the other research saying that people felt that if you had a diversity program, okay, we solved our problem, we're creating a backlash, but we collaborate, we work together, people buy in. Now, you can force them to buy in, and they're going to spend their time sabotaging you. So you need to decide what you want. Do you want to feel good because you got them where you want them, or do you want to do good and work together? And you may not get, and you're not getting everything. Okay, let's just, if you, the notion that I have to have everything destroys collaborative conversation. So think about what is really important to you as you engage in these conversations. Okay, so is there arguments against uh, what I talked about, mutual accountability, collaborative conversation? Here's some of the arguments that I've heard. Uh, the focus should be on issues of justice. In fact, I have a, uh, a talk, a, a good faith debate coming out on, on the gospel uh, coalition, gospel the Gospel Coalition is coming out in a few weeks where we talk about justice and reconciliation. And what's funny is, I thought that he was going to argue that you know you, you don't need reconciliation for justice. He thought I was going to argue you don't need justice for reconciliation. And we we're both wrong. We both agree. You know, it's sort of like well, we agree 95% of the time. You know, we both agree you need both. You need both. You cannot have justice without reconciliation, folks. What happens without justice without reconciliation is you get revenge. Make no mistake about it. Some of what people call justice is pure revenge. You got to hear everyone out. Even when people have been in the wrong, they got to hear the other people. Because <clears throat> they have an interest not to have revenge done unto them. Human depravity says as much. Some of the people who are, who are incredibly abusive were abused themselves. Th this does not mean we don't listen to people being abused. What we do say is we listen to everybody, bring <laughs> everyone in the conversation. So yes, this is about justice. And in my opinion, it's the only way we're going to get true justice. It's unfair for people of color to be expected to engage in conversation. So I've, I, this is another thing that I've heard. You, know, you can't expect a person of color to engage in this conversation. Uh, you know, they've un undergone so much. And you know, where I come back is, I understand where that's coming from. In fact, there are times where I disconnect myself from these conversations. I need a break. I need a break. But I cannot expect people to change unless I'm going to be there with them. If, if I'm going to want to lead someone towards Christ, but I'm going to go, man, it's so tiring, and, and you know, uh, I'll just give them the Bible and let them, and let them figure it out on their own. I hear a version of that sometimes. Here's some books, go read that, and then you can come back and talk to me about it. 
And that person, unless they're really well motivated, is going to go, you don't really care about it that much. Why should I, why should I do this reading? So we have to engage. <clears throat> engage. That's, just, that's just the way it is. Take breaks when you need breaks. No shame in that. But stay engaged. Because I, I realize, you know, sometimes I want to take the break and have the break last forever. Uh, <laughs> but I realize if I do that, then, then my voice is gone. And I only have myself to blame. I can't blame the white man for taking away my voice if I don't use it. That's, my, that, that's on me. You know, I have to take responsibility for that. Take breaks. Don't let them be forever. Uh, but you have to be involved all for that. And, and I understand where people are coming from. But for us to hear you, and for, <clears throat> for us to hear you, you're going to have to hear us, too. And I've been taught being too nice to whites. And uh, you know, I find that interesting, because when I teach my race ethnicity class, we, we, we spend quite a few weeks on in institutional discrimination. And, and we, you know, we, we talk uh, about uh, you know, uh, the powers that European Americans have. I have no problems critiquing colorblindness. I will do that tomorrow at chapel. Uh, I have no problems challenging whites. But there are certain things I will not do. I will not go to a white image bearer and say, well, you don't have a, you don't have a say in this conversation. I will not go to a white image bearer and say, well, you know, uh, you, you just need to shut up and do what I tell you to do. Because that's not what Jesus has instructed me to do. What I will do is challenge people and welcome, you know, conversation. And I find when I do that, when I'm in front of, uh, I'm often in front of conservative white audiences, and I find, obviously, I'm not batting a thousand percent, but I have quite a few come up and says, you know what, I, I got to rethink some things. Because I've listened to them, I know where they're coming from, and I, can, I, I know how to talk to them in ways that they don't put the, the fences right away. So if that's being too nice, then OK, fine, I'm too nice. I'll, I'll just accept that. But I am also know I'm effective. I'm more interested in doing good than feeling good. Now, we know that this is uh, not effective because we know how to win arguments in social media, don't we? I mean, we don't, I mean most of y'all probably have uh, Facebook or, or, or Twitter or TikTok, you know, why you have TikTok, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> and you know how you win arguments on social media? Clever insults. Clever insults. I grew up playing the dozens. How many of y'all know what the playing the dozens means? No? Okay, all right. The one sister in here, you know, what the playing the dozens <laughs> means. Playing the dozens means you're very good at giving insults. You know, I grew up playing the dozens. I'm, I'm quite good at it. And plus, you know, I'm educated so that I can put that little educational spin on the insults. So, I can win social media, yeah. That's what God made me for. Uh, how much time do I have left? Three minutes, oh, this is bad. Uh, okay, so I'm just gonna, you know, this is what we do in order to win arguments on social media, but you know what? It does not convince anyone of anything. And God convicted me of this a few years ago. And if you look at my social media today, I tr you know, I'm, I'm still a work in progress. But what we do know, and because of my time, I'm just going to put these up here. This is what research says we need to do in order to convince people. And let me and just read this. Let me just say, you know this if you teach about evangelism. Think about how you teach about evangelism, and think about how we talk about racial issues. Think about the difference between the two. You know that you build rapport. You make people have a good point. You find areas of agreement. We know this, so why are we not doing this? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and skip this. Too bad because it's great, but <laughs> no, they have to buy the book. Yes, yeah, it's in the book. <laughs> All right, so I'm gonna let this be my last slide because of because of time. Because Mateus is looking at me. Really. <laughs> yeah. Uh, What's happening in our society is social media creates more heat than fight, than, than, than light. You know, we have all this heat. You know, we have to argue about everything. We have to, we have to score points in social media. Our society has not learned how to communicate 
and, and how to listen. Focus on power, and that's that other slide, power and more. Oh, that's a great slide. Uh, power rather than communication. We focus on winning. Focus on putting down the other people. We need to focus on learning the techniques for having better and produ more productive conversations. Let me just close with this. You know, do you want to do good or do you want to feel good? Because we, you'll have an opportunity to take this institution, create a community, create the conversations they're not having out in a, a society, and be an example. And that will draw people. That will draw people into the post-Christian world. But, you, but it's going to be uncomfortable. You have to listen to opinions that you do not like. And you have to learn how to talk to people that you may be uncomfortable with. So it's not going to feel good all the time. Do good or feel good. Do good or feel good. Which direction do you all want to go? And if you want to go the direction of, the do, of doing good, of having these sort of conversations, I'll be right there with you. God bless. Good afternoon, everyone. And um, before I get to the substance of my remarks, I do want to thank Dr. Yancey for his, for his remarks and for the hard work he has put into the assessment and recommendations for the seminary very specifically. I also want to thank Dean DeCampos for the inv invitation to respond. I should say from the outset that my remarks were based on this PowerPoint that Dr. Yancey gave me in advance. Uh, I also had the joy of reading his current work Beyond Racial Division, a Unifying Alternative to Colorblindness and Anti-Racism to grasp his argument better and to do better justice to what he's talking about. Uh, I'll, I'll say this too, sort of ex cathedra from what I've written. I, I don't think there's a whole lot that I have in significant disagreement with some of the things that he has talked about. So, um, and I think he raises some very, very important points and I want to thank him very, very specifically for some of those things that he has done. Um, I think there's a, there are some questions in terms of implementation and some discussions, I think, about what is already happening. Plus, plus um, I'm, I'm trying to be focused in my remarks to look at a very, very specific context, and that is Christian institutions specifically. Uh, what's good for us as Christians is good for the whole world. I, I, I know that. That's the whole gospel, <laughs> right? Um, but I think there's a sense in which we have to understand that if we are in institutions and communities that are calling themselves Christians, there are higher expectations of us, specifically because of the commitments that we have made to God and each other around the valuing of personhood, the respect of the Imago Dei, and the advancement of his kingdom. So I'm thinking it with those things in mind. So in his presentation and, uh, and in his book, Dr. Yancey does advance this model of mutual accountability based on the practice of collaborative collaborations in which parties across racial dividing lines seek solutions to racial alienation that move processes forward. He contrasts this with practices of colorblindness and anti-racism, which enter discussions with presuppositions and non-negotiable stances that seek to impose restrictions on the other party. As a result, there is no progress on the problems arising from the presupposed uh, racial alienation. This intractability undermines collaboration and movement for individuals and institutions alike. In contrast, mutual accountability through collaborative conversation seeks to advance the interests of both parties, settling for partial gains for both and solutions that can move both forward contrasted with all or nothing approaches that can leave us stuck. His appeal has compelling imperial, empirical and theological bases and should work based on these strengths. However, some concerns raise uh, the question of effectiveness and the costs required for implementation. My first question concerns the presentation of anti-racism as a failed strategy for resolving racial alienation. Essentially, my question is, 
do we need to define specific types of anti-racist practice that promotes the imago day of all persons by confronting institutional practices that privilege some representations of God's people over others? Shouldn't we discuss different type of anti-racisms, plural, rather than lumping them generically with the worst examples of this strategy? Now, I assume here we're discussing about institutional systemic change rather than personal interchanges, although both are context for this type of practice. It is hard to defend colorblindness as a personal or institutional practice as, as in both these contexts, both require denial of how social systems work and repudiating the eschatological vision of Revelation 5, 9, and 7, 9. Uh, in both those places, there's no color blindness at work. There's no cultural sort of homogenization. We're not all gingerbread men and women. They are very, very specific. Uh, but as far as anti-racism is concerned, we need a more nuanced engagement with what anti-racism is to, to is to actually do it justice. As Dr. Yancey reports, leadership, studies, sociological studies, and anecdotal reports are replete with accounts of anti-racism done poorly. As Dr. Yancey rightly states, there are often attempts to stake out platforms of power rather than transformative spaces, or creating, I should say, transformative spaces where all can thrive interdependently. That's a very important adverb, by the way. As far as the experience of Dr. Vincent Lloyd is concerned, if he was constrained, now, I, I mean, I've read the article. I don't know what the full context, I mean, he described it, but I'm not sure what the full context was that he had going into his particular exercise or his uh, commitment there. But if he was constrained by ground rules that permitted throwing out participants and other actions, then this constitutes pedagogical malpractice with the experience that is bound to fail. We're talking more about Lord of the Flies rather than the Kingdom of God. This is what, I mean, with those constraints in place, I don't see how that was going to succeed. Moreover, it is no secret that institutional imposition of top-down, broad-based approaches without buy-in from the rank and file are also doomed to fail. Um, we are persons with dignity, um, Plus, because of our depravity, we're rebellious by nature. We don't like being told what to do. And so we've got problems. And so the irony is that many failed anti-racism or diversity efforts flout the principles Dr. Yancey has enumerated. Forced compliance, flawed structures for engagement, no anchoring of objectives and institutional mission, and so forth. However, if we were talking about Christian institutions, are we not beholden to biblical expectations that create a sense of belonging and to seek the welfare of all their members based on ethical commitments and biblical assumptions of the benefits of all in a body? And I'm thinking 1 Corinthians 12 here. That's a kind of a rooted scripture I operate out of very often and very frequently. Often this requires institutional postures where historically marginalized voices get to speak about what is lacking for mutual thriving. And if an institution has been operating out of a set of cultural norms that have not included marginalized voices, specifically persons of color within the body of Christ, then there must be conversations about change. Remember, persons from marginalized spaces are already collaborating in conversations simply by choosing to be in the institution. They've already started that by choosing to be here. So the onus is on the institution to take a posture that fulfills its mission and which submits to a biblical imperative. And there are many organizations that work out of this framework. Um, Edmondson and Brennan's Faithful Anti-Racism, Moving Past Thoughts of Systemic Change, coming out of the Racial Justice and Unity Center, for example, or even Emmanuel Gospel Center's Race and Community uh, initiative as well are examples of organizations that are thinking with this in framework in mind. And they would say that they're doing anti-racism work. My second question concerns how one promotes buy-in for these collaborative conversations. Given the long historical arc of disappointment, I'm a historian, I'm just saying that, 
And with all due respect to my sociologist colleagues, we tend to have a lot, a lot more of an extended view of things. I'm not saying they're sociologists. <laughs> um, and, I, and a lot of my best friends are sociologists. So, uh, <laughs> I've been preserving stories, too. <laughs> uh, but I do think, think long-term, but I also think long-term backwards. And so when we're talking about buy-in for collaborative conversations, we're talking about practices that actually have been in place for a long time, but there has been a lot of disappointment. And given the long historical arc of disappointment experienced by people of color in predominantly white Christian institutions, how will we obtain buy-in for the model? So buy-in occurs both ways. Buy-in, we need buy-in from whites in predominantly white institutions to actually have a conversation, but we also need buy-in from persons of color who repeatedly have been disappointed by Christian institutions and have not found a place of belonging or have really struggled while they've been in those places. I have no doubt that there is considerable incentive to improve conditions wrought by racial alienation. But the model as it has been presented, and if I stand under correction, I'll stand under correction if I'm missing something here, but it makes assumptions about the preparedness of persons to participate. I speak here mostly of persons of color or in a more generic sense, those social groups in a subordinate position in a social order which could also, frankly, mean poor white folk. Dr. Yancey's book discusses the greater emotional and psychological burden subordinate groups must pay to participate in these conversations. It therefore requires a lot of trust to enter into these conversations, and right now, much of that is lacking. From a historical perspective, there are understandable reasons for this, and I will just mention just two. First is the recent racial trauma suffered by many people of color over the last three years, specifically signified especially by the deaths of George Floyd and others, but also by other systemic assaults on their lives. Traumatized persons, especially those with generational trauma, have a very high trust threshold and will be understandably wary of entering into a process if they think it will not produce meaningful change. Second. There is a long historical arc of folks of color bearing a disproportionate emotional and psychological risk only to face disappointment. This model is actually not new. There are various forms of collaborative conversations over the years, including but not limited to organizations like Promise Keepers, which made an explicit point of racial reconciliation as a goal, and multiracial church congregations, which I would think have an implicit commitment to this type of approach but there has not been any staying power. Promise Keepers lost its impact after this explicit commitment with active involvement diminishing considerably after it was explicitly announced that this is going to be one of its primary platforms. While Corey Edwards has shown that multiracial congregations have really proved to be sustainable over time, often reverting to expressions of the dominant cultural paradigm or white folks leaving congregations, especially where there is black or brown leadership. And of course, the overwhelming support of white evangelical for Donald Trump in the 2016 election. See, I'm a historian, I haven't forgotten that. There's a lot of incentive today to kind of act as though that's kind of past history, nah. <laughs> folks are remembering this, and that has decreased the trust level, right? So. Um, Donald Trump, a person, and I'll be honest, it's a person who has a long track record of disdain for black communities. I grew up in New York. I saw this firsthand. This has put pay to any remaining trust that remained at that point. Many received the messages that white believers would put their interests ahead of other believers of colors when it is expedient to do so. With such low existential trust level, one might excuse the reluctance of folks of color to engage in another process where they have much more to lose if it fails. I'll say something here. Um, the cost for dominant groups is not just moral shaming of being designated a racist if there are these anti-racist things. And I'm not necessarily saying all of them are, should be universally applied, right? But I would also say that any Christian community where there is not the intentional centering of the way of Christ among different sets of human norm norms 
enacts a deep cost to all members of the community. Sometimes the chief motivation that we have to enter into these conversations is desperation. Um, to, to borrow Benjamin Franklin's famous line, if we don't hang together, most assuredly we will hang separately. He said this in the, during the revolution. And although God is God, and his promises are always going to be kept, and he will do and accomplish what he wants to do, I'd like to think that institutions are, um, institutions have to think very much whether or not they are committed to this and whether they're going to invest in the long-term work of building trust within marginalized communities where, according to demographic dimensions, is where a lot of the expansion of the body of Christ is now, whether they are survival or not. Conversely, um, marginalized communities trying to do their own things in many different ways, but we, we need our white brothers and sisters who need the voices in order to fully reflect the work of God, the evangelistic work of God, the witness of Christ in the world about how this is, this is going to work. We are the last hope. God is the last hope among us. If there is no hope in us, then where is hope to be found? Again, I thank Dr. Yangtze for the opportunity to, to respond to this discussion and for the platform of the forum to share these very important questions. Thank you. Outstanding contributions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yancey and Dr. Roll. Uh, we will open for questions, even though our time is a little uh, short today. But I just want to uh, highlight the fact that tomorrow we have an extended uh, second part of this conversation at 9 a.m. here in this room where we're going to parse out some of these things as it relates specifically to the issues of our campus. So if you're a student here, staff, you're more than welcome to come. So if you uh, would please move to the mic and um, those who have questions, remember uh, to ask a question and not a, what I call a sermestion, which is a sermon disguised as a question with introduction, three points, and a conclusion. So that's not what we're looking for, ask, ask, ask uh, questions. But I'll uh, start by giving Dr. Yancey a, uh, a chance to perhaps respond to the comments that uh, Dr. Rowe made. Sure, thanks. Uh, I'm trying to remember the, the, uh, the first major one, but I'll start with the second one. Uh, I am very aware <laughs> that this is a part of a long journey. You know, I don't expect that, hey, I wrote a book, now everyone's going to have this conversation. Uh, and I, I do know that there's a lot of mistrust. And even though I, you know, I try not to bring up the Trump thing, but I know that that was a very big break. Uh, you know, in trust. Uh, but uh, part of it is, well, where do we go from here? I mean, the only thing we can do. Now, I, you know, and I, I tell my, my, uh, my white friends that, you know, there's a reason why people of color don't trust. And that does not excuse everything that happens. You know, uh, you know sometimes they're going to do you wrong. Just on you're going to do them wrong. Uh, but, but there are reasons why this, mis this mistrust is, is there. Uh, but it, the... the uh, most effective approach is going to be to work together, especially in the post-Christian world. And so somehow we, we, we gotta learn how to get through this and it doesn't happen overnight. I think this is a generational solution. Mm. You know, I don't think that I'm gonna be alive when, when it's there because there's so much powerful forces pushing colorblindness and pushing anti-racism that uh, you know, I think this third approach, I'm working you know, as much as I can to try to do it, but I'm hoping my boys can enjoy it because I don't think I'm going to get to. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's sort of uh, my perspective. And your first point on anti-racism. That, that's well taken. Uh, I tried to find the things among popularized anti-racism, not as much as ac the academic, although I think there's a lot of overlap, that really was not really arguable among the major books. Now, I, I do think that you know, among Christian anti-racists, it's not as bad. I still think that there's, there's still some blind spots that they have. Uh, I just wonder if, you know, uh, if anti-racism starts really pushing towards having open conversations, will people recognize as anti-racism? And will it just turn into, uh, you know, cloud conversation? And if anti-racism turns into cloud conversation, I will become an anti-racist. You know, I, I don't see that yet. I see that there's, there are some that are better than others. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Uh, but I don't, see, I don't see it yet. And, and maybe, maybe it's happening, I've not read about it yet. Uh, 
But from, from what I've read, it, it, there was always this sort of hierarchy that was created, unfortunately, which I think in, inhibited it from being able to do what it needed to do. And, and like I said, you know, half of anti-racism, I'm like on board. So it's not like I'm totally against anti-racism. I tell people, look, sometimes I'm anti-racist. Sometimes I'm when, I, when I grab my student's paper, I'm colorblind. You know, so I'm not saying that, that, that there's never a place for any of these, this stuff, but I, I would like to say an anti racism pushing towards where I'm at. And if it gets to, close to where I'm at, then I, I hope that I'm mature enough to change and say, okay, anti racism is doing what I hope to, at least this version of it. Uh, but, you know, like I said, I've read, I read the books at that time and I didn't see any of, of, what, of what I was talking about in those books. So. Thank you. Uh, I don't see anybody. Um, Jump into the question, yes. <laughs> Dr. Bartz. Thank you both. Loved it. Um, I have a question for both of you, but somewhat more for Dr. Yancey. It seems to me that this is three-dimensional chess because there's a generational element to this. You know, I, I was suckled on colorblindness. That was the progressive position, right? I have a dream. You'd be judged by the content of your character, not the color of your skin. So now we have that distinction as well. I'm wondering how much of this is complicated by generational differences. I think you have a point there. <clears throat> you know, uh, I, I talk to, sorry, older folks all the time who, uh, who, uh, <clears throat> who say, hey, you know, I was told that I was progressive because I didn't see skin color, I didn't see that. And, and so I, I'm sympathetic to being raised like that. Uh, I th and I think probably to be honest at the time when you're in a situation of that sort of overt racial abuse, that probably was progressive. It's just that, at, and probably the people at the time didn't think about what sort of enduring uh, wounds would that create? So that just being colorblind would not be enough to, 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 to solve it. And, and here's the question, here's, here's the big question that we have to ask. Because there's two facts that I think are undeniable. One fact is that we had a history, we've had a history of racial abuse. See, I do study some history, so. <laughs> We've had a history of racial abuse. There's no denying that. Second fact is those mechanisms of abuse are no, we don't have slavery any longer. I hate when people say, hey, I feel like a slave. No, you don't. Read, read, your, read, read what slavery was. You know, you may be mistreated, but you're not a slave. Read what that was before you say something like that. So, now in a society where overt racism is, is generally not allowed, uh, but we have those, what do we do in order to create fairness? And that's a difficult question. I mean, there is no, that's why we have to have these, there's no easy answer. That's why I say, I don't have all the answers to that. Uh, but that, that's where we're at. We've had all this abuse that's created these gaping wounds. And now, you know, we say, all right, we've gotten rid of all the things that created the wounds, but what do we do now? Now you can overcorrect. I don't think the solution is let's have white people as slaves for 400 years. That's not the solution. You can overcorrect, and that's what sometimes people don't get. You can't overcorrect on this, but you, get, but you can't do nothing. So that's, that's, I mean, it's a difficult situation. There's no doubt about that. Um, again, I, I'm going to agree with my, with my colleague here, particularly with the three-dimensional generational things, but I think a couple of things need to be stated. Um, Dr. King's statements in that, that very, very famous speech were always aspirational. He was never speaking as though it was a fait accompli. I think, you, again, 1960s, to still the mentality, and you know, particularly when I teach historiography classes to students, I talk about the error of progress. And the error of progress talks about how um, human beings are just getting better and better and better, and eventually we'll just go and solve it out. That's a very enlightenment mentality. Um, Dr. Yancey has talked about depravity. We know about depravity. I mean, things may look like they're heading toward progress, but boy, I mean, our depravity will muck it up any way, shape, or form. So that it looks like we're getting, you know, we have space cars and everything else like that, but boy, you know, just because there are advancements in technology doesn't mean that, that you know, we're better people for it. So, social media. Um, so, um, so I think that's important to mention that. And I think it's also 
important to mention that I think folks who like to trot out King a lot really haven't read top to bottom all the things that he wrote about. And some of those things, frankly, if you were to say them today, some would freak a lot of people out. Um, so we need to do some justice to King uh, in the fullness of what he was talking about. Who, who wouldn't want that type of a dream? I think everybody wants that type of a dream, right? But, and I'm being very, very flagrant here, the devil is in the details. How we get to that point is very, very important and requires sacrifice on everybody to make that work. And I don't know, are we willing to do that? It's going to be costly. Are we willing to do that? And I think that's the challenge that's facing us in the midst of this. Thank you both uh, for all of the challenging and enlightening things you've shared. Uh, Dr. Yancey, I have a question for you, particularly around trauma. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how much um, generational trauma and or racial trauma factors into your work when you do your research. And, um, and the interdisciplinary um, are rapidly exploding understanding of trauma in the brain. How does that factor into a sociologist's work? Yeah, so... <clears throat> Yeah, sociologists don't deal with uh, that sort of individual elements as much. And so what we tend to do is we tend to look at, uh, a, you know, I guess means and averages and, and that sort of thing. And so <clears throat> when, we, when we do research, uh, like I showed this research that diversity training doesn't work. Doesn't mean it doesn't work in every single situation that there could be individuals where it does work, but on average it, it has these, these uh, dysfunctions connected to it. Uh, I, you know, I think about that, uh, you know, as far as racial trauma, I know that there's work on racial trauma uh, that, that's being done. And, uh, I, you know, there, there, there's, there's not an easy answer to that. Uh, there's not an easy answer as to how that sort of healing takes place. Uh, sometimes people act out of it and, uh, and it's sort of like, uh, I don't understand why you're doing that. Well. Once you understand some of the uh, some of what's happened, then then, then we can uh, then you understand why that is occurring. And and there's also the generational element of it. You know how we're passing along. To, you know, and those are all those are all uh, tough questions for dealing with. So uh, so yeah, I, I do think that it is a part of it. Probably as a sociologist, I don't factor it into large scale issues as much, other than looking at how a, how a group has been traumatized, and so where do we go from there? 